Good afternoon. Welcome back to another rendition of the BNH virtual event space. We are celebrating World Wildlife Day a day early. It is tomorrow, March 3rd, but we're <laughs> celebrating it today. And you are tuned into the secret life of animals, animal behavior, and wildlife photography with the man himself, Jerry Vanderwalt. Jerry, what's going on? Derek, nice seeing you, man. How's life going? Life is going good, man. It's good to have you. I'm it's it's just it's bad that you're here in New York. Yeah. And we don't have you in person. Last time I saw you was in person. I know. I'm, I think I'm like seven blocks from you right now, but we'll meet for coffee tomorrow. So we're good. We're good. There we go. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll get it covered. I do want to send a uh, special welcome to everybody joining us out there. We got people on YouTube, Vimeo, live stream, Facebook, all over the yeah. internet. Um, so we're, we're in for a, a packed house online and a lot of really good information with Jerry today. I do want to remind everybody, if you do have any questions at all, you can drop them in the comments section if you're joining us across the internet, or if you're right here on Zoom, we do have that wonderful Q&A module. But Jerry, I'm going to give you uh, the floor and I'll see you in a little bit for some Q&A. Awesome. Thank you, Derek. Good stuff. Hi, everybody. So officially, my name is Jerry. I'm from Wild Eye. And I'm going to be sharing a presentation that I did in Chicago a couple of days ago. It was a workshop based on six hours worth of content. So I'm going to try and condense it for you as much as possible. And the idea came around when I was speaking to Derek and the guys at BNH, and they mentioned World Wildlife Day. So with wildlife photography, that's what I do. I'm going to give you a very short brief, and then we'll dive into it, is... Many years ago, I came from a different world and I ended up managing safari lodges. Long story short, I created, along with two of my business partners, Wild Eye. And what we do is we go out into the wild places of the world, not to photograph wildlife for ourselves, but we take people like you, like our clients, into these places and we help them get the best images possible. Now, now, it's very easy for you to get on a plane and go anywhere in the world and look at wildlife, tigers, elephants, polar bears. But the more, and this is with life as well, the more you know, the better it gets. And that's what I'm going to try and dig into a little bit for you guys today, and specifically looking at wildlife behavior. Now, all of you tiling in here, thank you, first of all, but you should have some sense of photographic passion. Yeah, that's why you're following BNH. That's why you've joined us today. So the idea with what I'm going to do is I'm going to share a couple of videos just to give you an idea of why animal behavior is important. We're then going to look at something which I'm quite proud of and I'm going to roll out with some of our clients this year is my animal behavior triad. Three different things you could look at with animal behavior in order for you to understand the thing that you're photographing better. The more you know, the better it gets. And then after that, once we've done that, we're going to look at each thing individually. And then I've got a whole bunch of images now, uh, sorry, videos. During those videos, I'm going to play them. And I want you to look at it from a photographer's point of view. I want you to look at that scene and say, there's the shot, there's the shot, there's the shot. And hopefully by the end of this, you can have a little bit of a better understanding of where the shots are. I said to the people in Chicago a couple of days ago, the one place I think that the majority of wildlife photographers sometimes, I want to say leave image quality on the table, is their image choices. Like when we're on a safari, on a photographic safari, We'll go out in the morning, we'll photograph all these amazing things. We'll come back, we'll sit around a table and everybody's doing Lightroom. And then you'll walk around and they'll say, oh, hey, Jerry, did you see the image I posted on Instagram? Cool. So we'll go and look at Instagram and it's like, you know, it's nice, but it's not amazing. Let's have a look at Lightroom. And then in a sequence, in a sequence of images, they simply chose the wrong one. The foot position, the ear position, the, the nose position, whatever it is. So there's a lot to this. I could literally keep you guys busy until the end of World Wildlife Day tomorrow. But we're going to try and punch through this in an hour. Like Derek said, if you have any questions, drop them in the various comments on the different platforms. And we'll try and do that to, uh, at the end of this. And then I'm also, I'll, I'll remind you guys at the end, if you want this presentation, I'll make a video of it with all the videos included. And I'm happy to send that off to you guys. But for now, let's dig in. I'm going to share my screen with you. And let's get into this. So here we go. Okay, we just pull that open. And here we go. Right, so the idea with this presentation is, like we said, the secret life of animals. Now, let's get stuck in here. What Wild Eye is, is this the company I started and we do photographic travel. The main thing that I think that sets us apart from a lot of other safari operators is that every single one of my eight guides 
have experience in animal behavior. We've guided at high-end lodges throughout Africa for a long time. I've, for example, been going up to Svalbard to photograph polar bears for a long time. And I think that's the thing, that even if you travel on your own, even if you go on your own into the wild places of the world, speak to the local guides. And you'll see later on why. Local knowledge of which lions are territorial in this area, that matters. Which, uh, which season are we in and where are we? Those things matter. So while that is the reason that, well, I'm speaking to you guys and how I get to share this information with people. We'll wrap around that a little bit later on. So on the screen right now, <laughs> there are two things. The one is pretty difficult to photograph, pretty unpredictable and can be quite scary. And the other one is a lion. <laughs> now, I used to photograph a few weddings way back. Very scary. Very, very, I'd much rather face the lion on the side here. And this to me is the thing. In wildlife photography, it matters. Wildlife photography, wildlife matters more than photography. And if you approach it like that, you're going to win every time. You can only photograph well the things you truly love. So I've been walking around New York the last few days, and I like taking pictures on my phone, and I love the city. I'm not very good at it, though. My passion is wildlife. My passion is nature. And I think that's where it comes through. So just before we get into the behavior stuff, this is an important thing to understand when you photograph wildlife. This is from a presentation I did at BNH a couple of years ago before COVID. And it's just something I'm going to flash through for you, the continuum of wildlife photography, because not every image is created equal. Not every wildlife image is created equal. So how I do this is there's a couple of layers. There's proof. Then there's a document shot, then there's a narrative shot, and then you get creative. And that's how you start creating. Now, the reason I just touch on this is when you start looking at the types of images you can make when you photograph wildlife, you need to understand where they fit into this continuum. Just a few examples, if we look at lions, that is a proof shot. Now, a proof shot on this continuum is something that you can show this to your mom at home and say, look, I saw a lion. It's a bad image, right? It's a bad image, but you can see what it is. If you then go a step up, document. A document shot for me is a very good technical image of a species. For example, if you had to open up a guidebook and you say, this here is an image of a line. That's what it looks like from the front, from the side. So a document shot is normally where you would want to bank the images in any given sighting. I'm going to come back to these later on. Narrative. A narrative is an image that asks the viewer a question. This lion here is doing something called Flemin, right? The Flemin grimace. He's smiling at his lady. Now, what it is, is you know when a snake does the tongue in and out, in and out, they're busy gathering scent and taste molecules from the outside world, pulling it into their mouth, and the tongue goes up into the top of just behind the palate, right? There's something called the organ of Jacobson. Now, the cats have this as well. You can bank your money on whenever a male lion is walking behind a female, he sniffs where she urinated, he's going to come up and he's going to do this. What they do is they contract the muscles in the upper lip and it looks like a smile. Animal behavior equals the shot. So in my continuum, proof, I saw it, document, this is what it looks like, narrative. That's where a lot of wildlife photography behavior comes through, like as in this image. And then the final step for me would be the creative. That's where you play around. That's when you start looking at intentional camera movement, where you start looking at multiple exposure, slow shutter speed. I love the slow shutter speed world. So those four things for me, if you go into a sighting, let's say you come on safari with me or we go to look at polar bears, right? We go and look for polar bears. You see one a mile off. You take a picture just to be able to, on your phone, say to someone, hey, look, I saw that polar bear. When it gets closer, you try and document. Those are your bank shots. Boom, boom, boom. Good, solid, technically correct, but slightly boring images. And then you look for the narrative. How can I tell stories? We always talk about it. How can I tell stories? And then at the end of this, now you get creative, something like this. All right. Now, this here is important. Whereas humans extensively adjust their behavior based on experience through learning, the behavior of many animal species seems to be automatic. It's pre-programmed. Now, that's where it becomes interesting for me taking guests into the field and for you going to photograph wildlife. You can look at textbooks, and we'll talk about this. You can look at a textbook. What should a lion do in this instance? What should a gorilla do in this instance? 
Now, I'm going to show you a video here of this pre-programmed behavior. You know it's going to happen. Now, just a small disclaimer. I spoke to Derek and the guys before as well. Wildlife can be interesting, right? It can be brutal. It can be raw. It can be beautiful. So there are predator-prey interactions. I've taken a lot of the, on the six-hour workshop, I've taken a lot of the out. This, what you're going to see, is a lion cub playing with the dead zebra. Now, it's not gruesome at all. Don't worry about it. It was killed earlier on. And this young cub is going through pre-programmed behavior. This is what he knows. And this is what he's trying to do. So have a look at this. But I want you to look at it from a photographer's point of view. If you had your big lens, your four, five, six hundred mil aimed at the scene, you should eventually be able to get a pattern of what he's doing. So let's have a look. So this young guy, he's got nothing to do with actually taking this animal down, but he is giving his best. He knows he needs to do something with it. This is how he learns, right? This is how he learns. So he's going to play around with it. He's going to try things. And eventually, lions kill by suffocating. Now they do that by going either to the front of the nose, boom, or on the throat. Watch what the youngster does. He ends up there because he knows he needs to do something with this. That's pre-programmed. If you get to a kill in Africa, if you're lucky enough to see it, because it's not a common thing, you can't always bank on it, right? And there's cubs around, there's a very good chance that that might happen. So as a photographer, right, those are the shots you want. You want those interaction shots. That's the good stuff. Now, on an image like this, cheetah, you need to understand from a big cat in Africa point of view, the cheetah doesn't feature on the predator hierarchy. It kind of sits way down. Lions, obviously, the top. Then you get hyenas, wild dogs because of pack. You get leopard. And then cheetahs right at the bottom. So we were in this instance lucky enough to see this female take down this baby Thompson's gazelle. Now, the one thing that we all want is a good, solid animal portrait. Cheetah, she, she just took this thing down, right? The fact, and I'm going to show you a video later on, cheetah are very nervous around their kill. Two seconds after she puts this thing down, she will sit up, and that's when you get your shot. Animal behavior says it's going to happen, and I'll show you the video in a little while from now of how when she sits up, you wait for your shot. I have people sometimes on safari on their first trip, and something happens, and they have their mind set on, I want that shot, right? I want that shot. But then patience, huge thing. Photographing, oh, come on, come on, come on. And they get so upset, instead of just waiting, because animal behavior will play out. So what I did in this instance, just as a sideline, every time she sat up, I saw, I saw this image. It's a nice one for me to tell the story of a predator and a prey without showing any gore. On a personal level, I don't think photographing the blood and guts in Africa or any predator-prey ecosystem is the best way to portray it. I think we can be more creative, more subtle about it. Anyway, we'll get to some of those. Now, any animal has a certain world it lives in, things it interacts with, and where it stays. So what I did for the workshop that I presented last week is I came up with an animal behavior triad. There are three main elements to any animal. And I want you to think for yourselves, if you go and photograph grizzlies up in Canada often, or if you go to spirit bears, even whales and birds, we'll touch on birds a little bit later on, but any animal that you go and photograph, take this template that I'm about to show you, and then a couple of questions later on, Add them together, and I promise you, you will be in a better place and more equipped to photograph that thing well. So the first part of this is the individual. Now, every species has its own behavior, right? World Wildlife Day, look around online tomorrow. You're going to see all species being shared, and each of them have its own behavior. They have textbook um, behavior. At the end of this presentation, I'm going to share one or two textbooks with you if you are keen to do a deep dive. But a lion has, for example, a three-month gestation period, lives this long, and they have X amount of behaviors that is textbook. However, the animals don't always read the books, so it helps to have local knowledge. And then you have individuals. In some areas, like in the Masa Mara, there was an iconic lion called Scar. Now, I know some of you watching might have traveled with us to the Mara, and Scar was iconic. He had his own behavior patterns in Mana Pools, for example, in Zimbabwe. There's an, a male elephant that stands on his back legs. I'll show you videos a little while from now. He has a certain behavior. So if you understand the species you're looking at, the textbook version of what they should be doing, 
and then that the individuals might have variances. You've already given yourself more information to process when you photograph. The next step to this is interaction. And that to me is where the gold is in wildlife photography. Now under that, there are four things that we can influence. Intraspecies, so the same species on the same species, that could be mating, it could be fighting. Interspecies, that could be, and I've got a, a video in here of a crocodile and a baby hippo later on, which is quite fun. Predator and prey, that's always one of the most sought after things. When we travel into any ecosystem that has predators and prey, that's something we want to photograph, yeah? And then you also have the photographer. Whether you like it or not, when you step into the wild on foot, I've got some on foot videos for you, or you're sitting in a vehicle, your presence will be noticed by that animal. Their senses are way higher tuned than ours. So there are going to be moments when that thing's going to look at you. That's your shot. Don't push them for it, but be aware of it. Right. And then the last one here is the environment. Now, under the environment, you've got the reserve. If you look, for example, I'm speaking Africa specific now. If you look at the lions that you might find in a place like Sabi Sabi or Mala Mala versus the lions in Wangi in Zambia or, oh, sorry, uh, Zimbabwe, I should know that. Or then the lions in the Masai Mara. They're the same species, but the reserve has different behaviors based on the ecology of it, right? Seasonality, number two under environment. Under seasonality, there are certain things that happen at certain times. The quintessential thing there would be the Great Migration and how these wildebeest cross the river at a certain time of year. That then spirals off. All the lions and the predators move closer to the river. So seasonality is a big thing. Are the animals, for example, are they rutting? Are the impala dropping their babies, which is a seasonal thing? That means the predator behavior will change. You start thinking of all of these things, you are giving yourself way more chance to get the shots you want. And the last one on the environment that I have here is territory. Now, if you're going to an area and we know for a fact, you're coming with, we're sitting on a vehicle early in the morning, we're photographing lions, but we hear lions roaring on the different side. If a male lion is out of his territory, he will behave in a certain way. Now, that kind of knowledge you will get from the local guide, the guy who drives your vehicle, because he drives those roads every day. This information is important. Rhinos, for example, mark their territories. So they defend them actively. Elephants do not have a territory. They have a home range. So they're never going to fight because of territory. They might fight because of mating rights. All of these things in my animal behavior triad, keep them in mind. And when we go through these now, and when you go look at your own wildlife photography, use this, promise you it'll make a difference. So what are we going to do? Quick one here. Wildlife photography is like going on a first date. If you move too fast, you're likely going to go home alone, or in this case, with an empty memory card. Patience. Patience is the key. So this image here, for example, this was pure luck. I'm not going to claim that I used animal behavior. We were simply watching a river crossing in the Masamara. There was an explosion of dust pointed and the lion was hunting. So I'm not going to claim artistic brilliance on this one. But what we're going to do now, I've got three or four of these videos. I'm going to play the video for you first, right? This is a buffalo in mud. And I want you just to watch the video, but think photography, think long lens. I'm then going to show you three potential images based on the animal that you could get out of it. And then we watch the video again. So here we go. Buffalo. They're kind of grumpy. They look at you like you owe the money, right? They stare at predators. They're very, very aware. There's a shot, by the way. And then he also has mud on his horns, which means he's going to shake. It's a given. We know this is going to happen. So that could potentially be your first shot out of that scene. Normal species behavior, boom, portrait. Next one, over the shoulder look. It's a different dynamic energy. He's now looking off into the direction. Leave space for him to look into. And then there's the shake at the end. Watch the scene again. I'll show you where the shots happen. So normal scene, right? If you know behavior, just boom. That is a document shot. Document what the thing looks like. Here, we start going a little bit over into narrative. What is he looking at, right? And then if you're creative, you can go slow shutter speed when he's shaking and there's a shot. Okay, those are freeze frames from the video, obviously, but you get the point. Lion yawning, same thing. One of the... Biggest mistakes that people make when it comes to photographing not just a lion, but big cats, yawning, lion, cheetah, jaguar, uh, tiger, uh, who am I missing, leopard, right, is they start shooting too soon or they're waiting to wait. So watch the video first. 
you'll see there's a signal he gives us. There's your signal. See that little curly tongue? I'll show you again now. And then there's your peak. Today's camera is not really an issue, but people will often buffer out before they reach the peak because they shoot too soon. This is the signal you're looking for. When a bit, it sounds like a Star Wars quote. This is not the droid you're looking for. Anyway, moving back. So the little curl of the tongue, right? That is a hint. If a lion is just preening and preening, cleaning himself and so on and so forth, he's not going to do this. The tongue curling out and then opens up into the peak of the shot, right? Watch again. So there's our lion going. Watch for that little tongue drop. That's the behavior you're looking for. And then you get ready to shoot. There's the pause. And then from there, when they start opening up, now you start shooting. Boom. Okay. Often we shoot too soon. Every time a lion opens its mouth halfway, people are like, Grrr. no, wait for the signal. It'll always do that same thing. Jumping to a water hole. Zebras often drinking together. Same thing. I want, there's, there's more than two, but watch here. Choose two shots for me. Look at the middle two zebra. Their faces are too close together. I can't see both eyes, right? So that gets fixed now in that the one on the left opens up. That's a bit better. Now watch the guy on the right. That's also cool. I like that. Hello, there's your shot. So if we look at that, potentially the first shot could be this. We've got nice separation happening. Yes, in a perfect world, I would have liked the middle two to split up a bit more. But then also when the youngster on the right pops his head, watch the behavior in real time. So if you're looking through your viewfinder, right, you need to be aware of the behavior. They will move around. They are very edgy at the water because they're very vulnerable. He moves, checks, down, boom, there's your shot. The one on the right, they're always lifting their heads up and down because things eat them, right? So they have to do it, and that helps you as the photographer to get the shot, right? This one you need to be quick on. If you're lucky enough, if you come with me to the Masamara or Serengeti or wherever it is, and you get to see the fastest animal on the planet, the cheetah, hunt prey. It is probably one of the most difficult things to try and photograph at speed because people try and they're only thinking of getting the cheetah actually making contact with the prey species. More than likely, you're not going to get it. But if you approach it in a different way, you could. So I'm going to show you this video once. So the cheetah you'll see on the right hand side, the prey is not in, 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 um, in frame yet. Here we go. Full tilt. It's going after its prey. Thompson's giving it some horns. He did get away in this instance. Okay. So that's often what you will see and experience. So the first thing you're going to try and do when you photograph something that fast, pull back. Animal behavior means that animal on the left is basically fearing for its life, like in real time. It can do any direction. If you zoom in too close, you're going to cut something off. Your first goal when photograph hunting or any kind of interaction is to pull back a bit, leave space, and then rather crop in a little bit later on, right? Once the, the prey is out of the frame, stick to the cheetah because it's a very linear thing. It's going gonna, it's gonna to run straight past you there. In that instance, I would have just done that. And I would have just done that. Yeah? So obviously freeze frames from a video, but if you played with shutter speeds, once you see this once, and if you go to the Serengeti at certain times of year, you're going to see many of these hunts in a week safari. It's not unusual, right? Watch this in real time. Check for the shot. So the first one, I'm just trying to get a picture of predator and prey in one scene, which probably would be over there, right? They didn't come closer. That was the closest. Then I'm going to keep shooting and probably choose something there and over there, right? Knowing that how these cheetahs hunt will make all the difference in the world. It's... People often try and go too tight. It's a big problem. When we get to birds a little while later, we'll talk about that as well. A couple of more videos, not with the frames these times. This is a lioness in the rain. Now, what do wet cats do? They shake. I've written a blog post way back where I think it was just called The Shake, and it's been referenced quite a few people like, oh, The Shake, The Shake. Here's the thing. If you go on a trip and it starts raining, do not put your cameras away. Go to B&H, buy yourself rain covers. If your camera gets dirty, go buy a new one from B&H, right? Do that. But do not put your camera away in the rain. There's two good things that you can get. Watch this. She's going to shake, but every single big cat, when they shake, gives us notice. 
Oh, you can watch this once. Here we go. She lifts her head up. The nose comes up and then they rotate down from there. Watch. Nose goes up and then shake. And that's where your images happen. People wait and they wait to see the, 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 the raindrops go. Watch again. If we take it slowly. There, that is your notice. Any cat that gets wet, they'll sit and look all miserable. They're hating life. And then when they want to shake, the nose comes up to the top and they rotate from there. Watch in real time one more time. Animal behavior means you're going to get the shot. You see the nose going up. That's when you start photographing. Shutter speed, you can decide. Freeze it or get it blurry. As a rough guideline, if you want to freeze the dots, the, the dots, the, the rain spots, look at about one over 500 in a situation like this. And then keep on halving your shutter speed down. One over 500 as a base. If you want little streaks, one over 250. More streaks, 125. More streaks, 160. It's kind of a nice guideline to start playing with. All right. Now, if you ever want to photograph leopards, they are obviously phenomenal. And I would say one of the most sought after animals in Africa to photograph. If you're lucky enough to get two in one sighting. Watch this. So there's one on the far right here coming down. And there's one walking in the front. Mom and youngster. Right. I'm just going to play this for us. Watch what happens. So far, there's no interesting behavior here. When two things come together, especially, well, there's three, actually. There's no coming. There's when they're potentially going to connect, that's when gold happens. So I'm going to watch. Walk, nothing yet. It's all boring. Here, watch the behavior change of this front one. Suddenly, hello, let's just pause there. That cat now has given you as the photographer the notice and say, Something cool is going to happen, right? Don't zoom in tight. You have to be aware. If you tight on the back one, you're going to get nice leopard shots, but a cup of tea is nice. We want something better, right? So when this cat on the left here, watch again, it's walking along, and then suddenly it says to you, hey, watch me. I'm about to do something cool. I'll let you watch it first, and then I'll show you where the images are. It's going to pounce, yeah? We know this. Two younger ones. The one on the right is acting like he doesn't know what's going on. But you now don't want to zoom in too tight. You want to hold back a little bit because they have long tails. They can jump. Watch the interaction. I'll show you shots. Boom. Now, if you're a wildlife photographer with a big lens, you're going to be very, very happy if you photograph from here. Watch these moments. Click, 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 click. Ninja cats. Imagine that. I would, I would like that shot. Yeah. But that shot you could have gotten because of this one giving you notice over there when it went to lay down. Right. Moving on from there. Keeping our triad in mind. Again, the individual, interaction, and environment. Look at those three variables. Under individual, species, textbook, individuals. Interaction, intraspecies of the same kind, different species together, predator and prey in the photographer, and under environment, reserve, seasonal, and territory. I'm going to break all of those down a little bit more. But first of all, if you take anything from this presentation today, when you go out into the wild and you photograph good stuff, wildlife, ask these questions. What is it? Where does it live? How does it move? The social system, is it single? Is it, is it a solitary or works in a herd? Mating and feeding. Every one of those things will give you detail on how you can photograph these animals better. So from the polar bear on the right is from Svalbard. That to me, golden polar bear moment. It's a big male. The foot is in the right position. It's the back foot away from me. That's the one that's up. If you photograph animals, the more you know, the better it gets. So what I often do is when someone comes on a trip and they haven't photographed a particular species, gorillas, polar bears, elephants, or if they come on a private guided trip, I will say to them, listen, Go and watch this video and go and look at as many pictures of the thing we're going to photograph because it starts getting familiar. I want you to look at these three pictures of polar bears here. One, two, watch the body position, and three. Okay, this one here, if you understand bear behavior, specifically polar bears, these things live in a vast world. They live in a huge world. If a polar bear is walking like this, and if you do it, if you, if you go deep on the head, this is a very chill polar bear. Chill. It's going somewhere. It's got no hassles in the world. It just wants to get somewhere. So from a viewer, even if someone is not photographically literate, or if someone is not polar bear literate, right? They can say, okay, this is pretty cool. If you look at that animal, 
This is a slightly more stressed polar bear. It's not comfortable. It's got the head up posture, like up and slightly back looking around. It's like not sure what's going on here. It could be because of people getting too close, which should never happen. It could be because of another bear. It could be a female. She's scared for her youngsters. But the body position, watch again, between that and that makes a difference to what your image looks and feels like. This polar bear, slightly skinny because it was early season, but that's a polar bear that's comfortable in its own skin and that's sniffing the air, knows our posture, it wants to hunt, it wants something to eat. So again, the position of the animal's body makes a difference. And again, the more you know, the better it gets in every single situation. Again, this year, and again, remember guys, I'm happy to send you this presentation after the fact. Now, we're going to look at each one of these, individual interaction and environment, quick example of each one, and then we can go from there. So under the individual, right, there's three different things, species, textbooks, and the individual animals as such. Gorilla, we look at this, it's a yawn, right? So it looks very, your shot is probably there when he peaks, somewhere there, that's your shot. Why is he doing this? Is he tired? No, they sleep most of the day, they're very chill. Baboons, primates, they yawn to show dominance or it's a threat display. In this instance, this is the silverback of the, tri of the, of the tribe, of the troop, of the family. There were two blackbacks, the younger ones behind us. We position ourselves in a situation where they could see each other. And this guy kept yawning again and again. Why? Because he's saying to the other ones, listen, these are my weapons, back up. If you know the dynamic, if he, when he was on his own, the next day we found them, he didn't do it again because he was on his ace. So the dynamic makes a difference. The species makes a difference. Individual species, when you're sitting with zebra, right? They're males in, in, the, in, the, in the groups are always fighting. Pick two and let them do the rest for you. You know they're going to fight. They do that. Textbook cat behavior. Now, this is a lion, but it goes for all of the other animals as well. Again, jaguar, leopard, cheetah, your, your house cat at home, you should photograph them, right? This animal is going to walk from left to right. This is in the Masamara, beautiful open vibe. Now, watch the head position. The body's moving, the shoulders are moving, but the head moves in a perfect linear fashion. Why? Because it's hunting. So if you see an animal like this, you might not see what they're looking at, but just the way they move will tell you, listen, something might happen. Watch how she moves. Looks around. That head doesn't move. It's linear because she's focused on something. Now, there's some cool walking shots, which is great. But if, you, if you're with a cat like this on safari and you say to your guy, okay, let's go. We need to get out of here. You're making a big mistake because that cat is showing intent. It's promising you shots down the line. Animal behavior equals good images. Then individuals. A lot of you have been to the Masamora. You might know this cat. There's a scar. He passed away a year or two ago. Very unique behavior to the point where he was the most frustrating lion I photographed in my life. He would sleep for seven hours in the afternoon and would not wake up. But when he got up, he had an attitude about him. We knew him. We knew he as an individual had his own behavior. And we would look him out because of that, because we knew his behavior made for very good images. That's the gold. Now, interaction. In, in <laughs> intraspecies, mating rhinos, that's obviously same species, right? Um, this kind of image, I have a video of this, but I'm not going to show it now. They do that for half an hour. He stays on there for half an hour. So you have time to work your different shots. Interspecies, between different species, I'll show you a video. Predator prey and then the photographer. So two topies, this is a gazelle up, uh, antelope up in, in East Africa, fighting, easy stuff. Same species going at it. What do you do? Don't zoom in too tight because they'll clash and then pull back. If you're too tight, you're going to cut something off. Interspecies, different. So there's a lot happening here. It's a cheetah with two hyenas and a baby wildebeest runs away. I don't know what happened. They all try to eat the baby wildebeest and then they just exploded out. We got there as this was happening. But whenever you have two species in the frame, there's a question to be asked from the viewer, the guy who's going to read your image. Now, there's this, there's this thing in photography where we always say it has to be uneven numbers, one, three, five, seven, Yeah, because your brain wants to complete the pattern. We know that. So when we have a cheetah and a hyena, there's four things here now. 
I've had people who are photographing this, but I can't photograph this. There's two things. There has to be three. No. If you're photographing a cheetah and a hyena, you're not photographing two animals. You're photographing one interaction. You're not photographing uh, two lions who's going to fight. You're, in, you're photographing one fight. So just think about that when you get to this, because you don't want to be applying certain photographic rules at the, uh, without losing the animal behavior. Predator and prey. So this here, there's no, there's no drama in this one. It's a young, uh, young wildebeest that got lost in Dutu. And the lioness, she missed after this. So there she is in the open. The little wildebeest didn't see her. Now, as a photographer, I want you to check something. And you should be able to see this through your viewfinder while you're looking at this. Watch what happens when the baby wildebeest runs and silhouettes against the water and you know the lion is coming. Suddenly you have two of them silhouetted against the water. Watch this, I'm gonna run in, let me just fast forward and there she goes. Jog, jog, jog. Wildebeest has no idea yet. Still, she's looking for mom. And here we go, game time. As a photographer, watch this moment. You got the silhouette. Now you should, ooh, hello. Silhouette being chased against there. There's your shot, Grrr. yeah? So environmental awareness. And also, two species getting together. Don't zoom in tight and then try and follow from there. Um, I put this in. That's that scar line from a bit earlier on. You can see where he got his name from. He used to be an animal that would look at you directly. A lot of animals, if you do it right in the wild, don't focus on you. He focused on you. He would look at you, which was sometimes a little bit weird, but made for good for photographs. This is a uh, video I took on one of my trips to Mana Pools with some of my clients. I want you to notice now a couple of things in here. We're on foot with lions. You'll see two male lions in the distance. When we get there, they look at us. They see the photographer. They look at us. They are dominant in the area, i.e. territorial. They don't care about us. So they settle back in. We didn't affect their behavior. They looked at us and then they got back to what they do normally. There's audio to this one. So you see, there are the two males in the distance. They're very full. They're very fat. They give us a look. It's like, okay, we see these people. Not too stressed about them. This is all safe and with a guide. Don't worry about it. So you can see, getting in position. We didn't go any closer than that. But you can see the guy on the right specifically. He's looking directly at us. We are something in his territory, right? We're something. He doesn't want to eat us or fight with us or mate with us. He's looking at us. And he's like, meh, okay, I'm good. They are territorial. If it was a younger lion that was not territorial, the reaction might have been different. I know this because we know these lions. My guide who we use there knows this. That's why we were able to do this. Again, the photographer will get a look, but don't push your luck. Right, behavior and environment. This, what you're seeing here, is a behavior that happens in the Monopools Reserve in Zimbabwe. Elephants reach up certain time of year, so it's seasonal, because they can't, it's so dry, there's no other food. And then territory, let's look at this. If you want to see, for example, lions climbing trees, right? Lions climbing trees. We want to see it. Leopards normally do that. There's a pride in Uganda in Queen Elizabeth National Park that does it. This, um, I had a, one of my guides was up there recently, saw these lions around. In this area, they do it. So if you understand the behavior, you know where to go to get your images. If you understand where the great migration happens, you'll know where to go, your images, and so on and so forth. You are not likely to see lions climbing trees in many places, but here you can almost bank on it. Environment seasonal. So this is Boswell, this big male elephant up in Monopools, and he does that. He stands up on his back legs because it gets so dry, the only food left is the albedo trees, and he pulls the, the seed pods down. This is, uh, I think this is Fred, but this is what they do. So we can go on foot very close to them. You know it's going to happen, so you can prepare yourself. Get a wide angle, get ready for it. Uh, did I give you the wrong? Oh, he just came down. Okay, when I, when I send you guys the video, we will um, we'll fix that up. But that's what they do. They kind of give a small bop on the shoulders and they reach up every time. And it's a seasonal thing. Happens kind of between August going towards end of October. All righty. Territorial. If you know there's a territory dispute in an area, specifically with the big cats, spend time there we spent an entire morning in sabi sabi with this scene where there was a takeover males took over the pride right and everybody was fighting with everybody 
there wasn't any huge damage, but photographically we put ourselves in the best situation because territory is a big thing for these animals. Now, again, questions to ask. What is it? Where does it live? How does it move? The social system, mating and feeding. What you're looking at here is about 10 guinea fowl. It's a small game bird, only about yay big, right? But the thing is they drink twice a day, every day. So if you ever get lost in the bush for whatever reason, don't try it, but follow them, you'll get water. They drink twice a day, but they're very anxious little birds. They all sit at there and they kind of bob up and head, heads up and down. Multiple exposure shot with a slight slow shutter speed, you get something creative out of it, which is quite nice. On the back of those questions, the social and mating behavior of animals is what you should also be keeping in mind when planning your photographs and, and, and speaking to your photographic voice. To be or not to be social, what do these animals do? Do they have territorial mating systems, non-territorial mating systems, parental care? Like a male elephant will go in, mate with a female and leave. Kid's not his problem. He's out, he's out of there. Precocious and helpless young. A wildebeest baby, for example, gets born seven minutes. We've clocked it. It's up and running around. And then male participation. So the books that I'm going to share with you guys in a little while now will touch on some of this if you really want to go deep. Guys, wildlife photography is amazing as it is. You can do it just to post some pictures on Instagram. You can try and get some prints for your wall, whatever the case is. The more you know, the better images you're going to get every single time. And by focusing on these questions and these kind of things around mating, you're in for a nice surprise. So this is male lion and a female lion going to mate. There's a moment here which doesn't really happen in this one. And I'll explain to you now. The next video shows the full interaction, right? So you see he bites on the back of the neck. That is important. But then he's just like, okay, she's not really giving him anything back. This wasn't his best work. I'm not going to lie to you. Not his best work. The video that comes after this, a little bit better, the sign you're looking for here is when he starts biting there, when he starts biting the back of the neck. Now, what happens with cats mating, big cats, and the next leopard video is way more uh, dynamic, is the when the male pulls out, it hurts her, but he knows that she's then going to attack him. So normally he'll start biting the neck when he's almost finished, and what she would normally do, she didn't, she'll turn and she'll lash out at him. Those are your images. That's when you photograph. So your positioning should be good. This instance wasn't great. But also you can see at what stage of the mating, because these guys will mate every half an hour to 45 minutes for about four to five days. So if you spend some time with them and you see the mating, wait for half an hour, they'll do it again. But when you shoot, people start shooting now when it's in this position. Wait for the neck bite. So watch this now, right? This here, the freeze frame, that's your shot that you want. Watch what happens. So in this instance, she's, she's wanting it. So he's like kicking her away, like, no, 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 I'm tired now, not now. So she, her hormones are telling, no, she needs this. So she's going to be all flirty, bump him, flick the tail. And he's like, okay, cool, let's do this. Watch when he starts biting the back of the neck. That's when he's almost finished. And that's when she's going to pop around, try and bite him. And he jumps off. And there. This happens every time, especially early in the cycle. So again, here he is. He bites the neck. And as she pulls back there, that's your shots that you want. So instead of photo, if you start photographing from here, oh, uh, he's mating, quickly take the shot. Grrr. What you're just making work for yourself and start now when he bites the neck because you know that's going to happen and it's a given every time. So, the key moments just a couple of videos more. Lions drinking, they're always away. Normally, they'll drink early afternoon, late evening, which means the eyes are open, which helps. Not much sunlight, right? They will always be aware because when their head's down, they're looking around. So, as a photographer, you're deciding look at the three on the left, quite nice. You're looking for tongues but they will drink for quite some time and their heads will keep on looking at distractions. So if you know that off to the one side, there's more lines laying, they're going to look there. Plan your shots accordingly. These things are pre-programmed, like we said in the beginning. What we have here is a young female leopard dragging her freshly killed wildebeest from an open plane. They are secretive animals. They don't like to be in the open like this. Watch. Every once in a while, she stops, but she has a little bit of cover with the grass. 
there's an open patch. I'm just going to pause there. There's an open patch coming up. People will think, okay, cool. She's taking it from here to there. She's going to run past the road or over the road, right? So I'll take the shot there. She's nervous. She's not going to stop in the open patch. She'll stop when there's grass around her. So here's the road. Uh -uh. She, she hauls it across there to get away, stops when there's a bit more cover. So keep in mind, don't, don't look for the shot that's there. Look for the shot that you want. Don't plan in the open because the animal will not stop there, right, in the, in the open, open area. Now, what's going to happen here? You're going to have a baby leopard coming from the left of frame. There's always a moment where there's a cuddle. These big cats cuddle, little neck rub. And then the youngster is going to walk off to the right-hand side and almost without fail, the older one, either the older um, sibling or the mom dad, will kind of give them a bit of a smack. Those are the two shots that you want. Cubbing, coming. Mom's looking around. She's super chill. It's a beautiful background for the depth of field in this shot, though. You can see that. So watch. Coming in, there's a bit of a cuddle happening. So you should be tight on this. Beautiful. And boom, there's your shot. So again, let's pull this back. You know they're going to do something underneath each other over there. Right? Every time. And then there's the back. Boom. There's your shot. Every time. Animal behavior equals your image. Now, we spoke about the cheetah a bit earlier on. So this here literally just killed this. Drags it across, away from, she wants to put it in a thicker area. Looks around. Why? Cheetah don't feature on the predator hierarchy. Anything takes it. Hyenas will steal that from in an instant. So, so you're going to sit and look around a while first. Now you can take your portraits. This is going to happen again and again and again. Animal behavior equals the shot. So what we'll do, I'm going to fast forward for you here. So eventually, once she's chill, okay, cool, starts feeding, opening up to the back, uh, blah, 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 blah. And eventually here, you get there. After a while, it will feed for like five minutes. It's going to sit up again. You know it's going to happen. Wait for the shot. Bang a couple. You can now pull back a bit because you know it's going to happen. Look around, sits up. Cheetah will always do this. So you can plan your shots around that. Uh, this one here is, it was more just to do with the polar bear walking. It's a beautiful scene. This animal walked all along trying to show the scale of the place. I'm going to show you where we're going to here. So we were watching this bear for quite some time, and he did this once, about 10 minutes before I started this video. But he gives notice. So if you look for behavior patterns, again, you can predict the shot. So watch. Now he's sitting still, which is fine. The head's coming up and down, almost like he wants to sit up, yeah? Like he wants to bop up. Watch the behavior. If you're aware of the behavior, oh, there we go, gangster move, and down. He did this a couple of times. So eventually we started seeing by watching animal behavior when the shot's going to come. And you know what the thing is? Apart from getting better images through the behavior, it's also more fun. You start appreciating the aspect more. Elephants on Amboseli. Now, the matriarch is going to come in from the left here. They're always, they're walking in line. They're going from the marshes back out towards the, the dry lake bed. Just forward a bit. The one coming in. So there's a zebra in the background, which could be cool for photography. But watch this girl. Right? The matriarch often does this. She stops and reassesses things. Watch the foot. And carry on. Right, watch it again. The big girl coming in now. Right? She's the one that checks for danger and so on and so forth, communication. They often stop and she bops the foot, hangs it there. There's your shot, done. And move on again. You can try and get those while she's walking, but watch the matriarch. So you need to know who she is, what she's going to do, and you can go from there. Beautiful silhouette shots, this. Now, this is not a happy lion. Uh, this cat, when we found him, was very upset with life in general, life in general, and... The big thing you look for here is a cat that's eyes are open like this, the jaws dropped. When the tail flicks, you'll see the tail on a lion. If a lion's looking at you and the tail's flicking side to side, don't push, don't push your luck. Often then they'll give you a bit of like a bounce. See that tail? Watch it. It's a snarl. The tail, flick, 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 and there. This cat, and he was upset. Eventually we found out there was another male in his territory around a kill, but... That behavior, knowing it's going to happen, watch your tail going, the little snarl. You know it's going to react. In that case, make the shot before. Do I keep it wide and clue the tail? Or 
I decided to go real tight on the face and wait for that snarl and then go from there. Behavior. A lion roaring, right? It's more dramatic on video, but what you're doing here, it doesn't, when you see pictures online of lions snarling, people say it's roaring. No, that's snarling. This is what a roar looks like. The thing you want to focus on here, single point focus, pick the eyes because the head drops back and up. That's when they roar. You want the eyes. Watch when he's roaring again now. He pushes it out there. You want the eyes just over the nose. When a lion roar, this is how he does it. End of story. And normally if they roar once while you're sitting with them, wait a little while, they do it again. It's a territorial display and a contact display. So they're trying to get his, his mate was answering him. But the focus point here is not the mouth. The mouth in the lion roar isn't that pretty. It's like, ooh, like a little fishy mouth, right? The eyes is your focus point because that's where the power is. This was an interesting one. Uh, we're almost there. One or two more videos for you guys. Interspecies. What do you think is going to happen here? Baby hippo and crocodile. Now, some of you are thinking, oh, no, he's going to eat him. No, he's not going to eat him, right? There's obviously a baby hippo like this won't be on its own. So there's more in the water. But for photographing this, if you don't know what's going to happen, what do you do? Zoom back. And as they get closer together, you pan in with them. There's nothing here that's too big. This was just a fun. This little hippo was quite brave. Something's on his territory. So you should in, to zoom in tight. Okay, when's my shot? Whoops, there. <laughs> so when this little guy went in, so you, you're shooting all the time now. He's not that brave. The, hip, the croc runs and the hippo pulls back. There's your shot. Tail and hippo. Right? Keep on shooting. And off you go. You see, so he wasn't alone. There's more hippos on the side. But it's fun stuff to do. If you can ever get two different species interacting with each other in a shot, amazing stuff to have. Now, um, yeah, this is not, <laughs> nature's hard. Nature's rough, lions have to eat. So what happens here is it's a common behavior trait with predators that if they've got, and not with big animals, obviously the con not a whole zebra, but when it's a young animal, right? Often what they'll do is when it's close to the end for the young prey species, they'll grab it on the head and pull it up. Now, I know this sounds grim, but I, I, and I can hear myself saying it. I've seen my guides do it as well. Photograph now, he's lifting the head up. Okay, I know, I know, I know, wherever you are, it sounds horrible, but photography, we are here to document nature, right? So I'm going to play this once, and then you can watch the, sh the we'll, we'll pause the shot. Okay, it's a baby topi and the tail flick, right? So just coming back quickly. I know, just show you quickly. So the shot here would be the head up and the tail over. Different body positions. Right. Very quickly, two things on birds. We're almost there. Bird photography, same thing. The more you know, the better it gets. They have certain types of behavior. Now, vultures in the Masa Mara, if you're driving and in Serengeti during migration time, you can drive along the road and there'll be hundreds. I literally we counted 170 something on one zebra carcass. Again, Channel your inner photographer for me now. Imagine you're next to the road photographing this. You can go wide. You can go in with a 600. You can go in with a 1200 if you want to convert that. You can go slow shutter or you can pan it. But the thing here is animal behavior says this kind of stuff will happen again and again and again during a certain time. It's chaos in there. Think what you could do with a long lens, right? you got this chap in the front who's like, what's going on, guys? The ones at the back are just beating each other up. And you'll often very quickly find who the problem bird is. He's always the one making trouble. Generally, one sitting on top here. So the, those scenes are dime a dozen in the Massive Mara. They're all over the place. But you know, if you go there during migration time, you probably will see that. Now, just a very quick one on birds. It's a very popular thing for most of you guys. If you don't have access to big game all the time in Africa or, or Canada, grizzlies or polar bears, whatever, bird photography is a great thing. Now, one of the things that we often do is, again, behavior per species. The book I'm going to share with you now after this uh, is a great place to start. But bee eaters, beautiful little bird in Africa. They hunt from perch. They're all over the world, but they hunt from a perch. So instead of trying to follow them up and down, Sit for a walk, put your camera down, notice what they're doing, right? Get where they're hunting from, refocus on the branch, refocus on the branch, 
Give yourself a big depth of field, 7.18, whatever the case, even more, depending on your distance from the branch, nice and high shutter speed. And then you shoot from there. You pre-focus on the branch. What we often do is I'll sit and watch the branch where the bird's coming in. People are ready. They've got the settings dialed in because we know animal behavior. The bird is coming back. They're hunting from that perch. And as the bird comes in, fire now. That's how you're going to get your shots. Is they will always, see, they, they always, then they come and beat the, the thing to death on the branch like they're doing, but they all come back to the same perch. Instead of trying to pan them in, get your depth of field sorted by aiming on the branch and then shoot from there. So one last time, questions to ask, and this is birding, whales, whatever the case is. What am I looking at? What is it? Where does it live? Is it an open in the, in the thick stuff? If something lives in the thick stuff and you find them in the open, they're more generally going to be a little bit tense and wary, right? How does it move? Does it move fast, slow, fly, jump, swim? What is their social system? If there's one, should there be more around, right? Mating and feeding. What do they feed? How do they feed? Answer those things and you're going to be well on your way combining it with my triad to create better wildlife images. Now, for those of you that are keen to do a bit more of a deep dive, these three books are just ones that I've had at home that is worth a look. Game Ranger in your backpack, it's species by species, interesting information and so on and so forth. The middle one, the Safari Companion, I've got nothing to do with these guys. If you can get your hands on them, that's great. That is probably the Bible for animal behavior in Africa. Detailed, detailed, detailed per species, down to mating cycles and so on and so forth. And Isaac Pretoria, South African photographer, great guy. He wrote this book, How and Where to Photograph Birds. Lovely detail in there as well. So if, you, if I can help you get hold of them, let me know. But you should be able to find these anyway. Lovely books to start your process. And with that, we are done. If anybody has questions, Derek, then we can go there now. Yes, I'm going to invite everybody. Get your questions in now. There is no better time. Jerry, you, you know your stuff, man. It's impressive <laughs> listening to you speak. Like, for real, I was sitting over here and I'm like, you're such an engaging speaker. It, there's a difference between, you know, when you know when you were like back in school and you memorized answers mm -hmm. to the test, and versus that, and just knowing your, you just know your stuff, and it's just it's so exciting to listen to you talk. So a huge thank you to you for joining us. Awesome, thank you very much. It's, it's also I think it. I mean, when a passion like wildlife and nature combines with a passion for photography, it's such a golden thing. It's it's, it's amazing, man. It's so good. Awesome. It's great. Great stuff you're doing out there. I'm going to get it started. Uh, one of our longtime viewers here, Elizabeth, says, I didn't know wildlife photography was such an art. Well, there you go. <laughs> it is. There's a lot. To it, right. I mean, it, it's like you keep saying it's it's about the passion. You have to be passionate mm. about what you're taking mm. photos of. It's going to show through. In the yeah. Photo. It's a it's an interesting thing, Elizabeth. It's it's an art in that you can go very deep dive, but you don't have to. The biggest thing is, and as wildlife photographers, what we want to do is we want to go into the field. We want to photograph the animals doing what they do naturally without changing their behavior and leave without them kind of knowing we were there. So once you do that, it's a win. But it's, it's, I think for me, the goal is just if you were next to me when I made this image, I want you to see that. It's, it's storytelling and nature gives us, you, you just have to know your tech, your, your, your camera and your technical side of it. And you, you're halfway there. The other half is knowing the animal behavior. <laughs> now, going to the tech side, Elaine, who's joining us on Zoom, asks uh, or says, this is all fantastic, but then asks, what speed were you shooting the cheetah at? So for those Ooh. fast animals, what's mm -hmm. the range that you're in settings-wise? Do you ever try to, to slow it down a little bit and, and risk getting like a pan shot? Or how do you handle it? 100%. So, so on the cheetah shot, on the cheetah video, I would, if, if you see, if, if we're in a situation where we're going to see a cheetah hunting and you, you know it's going to happen. I mean, the body position, the hunting, the stalk, the animal doesn't know what's going on. For a cheetah, I wouldn't go anything under two, two and a half thousand shutter speed. Even more if you can. There is something and there's that fine balance. And I think this is what, what takes an image from good to great is when there's, you can have it crisp, which is great, but there's when the tail, for example, has a little bit of movement to it. That's the, that's the happy medium. So I would normally for the cheetah do 2,000 to 2,500. If it's your first one ever, and this is your one safari, you're going to back, go 4,000, just bang it out. If you're looking to pan, cheetah at that speed to pan, you can probably come right at about 125. But again, I mean, panning is a whole different uh, lecture altogether. 
is kind of how you go around it. But normally panning for me starts at about 1 over 30 for most species. For a cheetah like that, I would start at about 125, 150-ish somewhere. Hmm. When it's, I mean, I got to imagine when it's that fast, it's just, it's hard to. Oh, it's insane. The speed is crazy. Yeah. What is it? Top speed around like 60 miles per hour? Mm, yeah. They, they clock it in on kilometers just round about, yeah, probably 60, 65. Clocking it in kilometers, 115, just short of 120. It's ridiculous. But the, the, the interesting thing there is one of the reasons a lot of people don't get it is because we, we underestimate how fast they accelerate from sitting. They're sitting in the, literally four or five strides. They're at max tilt. So it, it's it's beautiful to see. It's beautiful to see. Well, that's what I thought was interesting about a lot of your points here. It's like you can tell that a lot of it is paying attention. It's not it's not going out and photographing. It's going out, yeah. paying attention, picking up the cues, the tells, the reads on these animals, mm. learning about them in advance and kind of yeah. knowing what you're going into before so that you can recognize the shots before they happen. Mm. One million percent. I think the, the, the one, the, the, the perfect example is if people come and they see the Great Migration, which is where you've got hundreds of thousands of wildebeest going through the river. And they, it's cool. when they get there, sometimes they've been so excited to see this thing that they pick up and they just go, grr, grr, they're just shooting. And often they'll say to people and they think they, they must think we're crazy. It's like, hey, listen, Derek, put your camera down for a few minutes and just watch because a camera teaches you to see without a camera. You, you're looking at different things, right? So, so without diving straight in, just give it two minutes. Just look at it first. Just look and see what catches your eye and then start photographing. But it, it's 100% what you say, that repetitive behavior pattern. Even if you don't know an animal, if you spend a little bit of time just watching, not through a camera, just watching, you'll start picking up the things that you would like to photograph, 100%. Now, Ava, who's joining us on Vimeo, asks, how can you determine the matriarch before the foot lift? Speaking about the uh, the elephant silhouette photo. Ah, good question. So often what you find is that the biggest one is the matriarch, but not always. Now, the next thing you can do from there is if you could imagine, let's say you've got a little family herd of between 8 and 15 elephants, right? If you could imagine yourself going like a drone, don't drone them because they freak out. But if you could imagine having a top view of these animals, the matriarch is generally the one that would be kind of center and the other ones come and go towards it. So it's almost like the, the sun around their solar system. So she's the one also that would start moving first and then the other ones follow. So there's, there's the behavior of everybody kind of, not, not all the time, but the youngsters might go and drink and they'll come back. The older ones might feed and they'll kind of gravitate back. And she's the one that will start walking and the rest follows. If another female of similar age walks in a direction, but they don't all follow, then that wouldn't be her. There's a combination there. One of the things that you could look for on a body point of view, elephants get what's called temporal wastage. So just above the eyes, on the temples, it tends to dip in a bit. It's like the older they get, it dips in deeper. And it's not 100%, but often the females with the biggest temporal wastage is more than likely the matriarch. So th there's a couple of things around that. Interesting. Uh, Julie, who's joining us on Facebook, asking, how do you find tour guides who respect nature and won't disturb animals just to get a photo? Ooh, how much time do we have? <laughs> it's um, so, so the, the guy, I can speak for myself and my company. Every single guide we've appointed, we had, we expected them to be qualified. In South Africa, it's called FAGASA, the Field Guides Association of South Africa, which means you've done exams and qualifications and so on and so forth. And my, my guys also have a lot of experience in there. The, 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 there seems to be a bit of a trend in a lot of the reserves and lodges and stuff that uh, are pushed towards this, more ethical guiding. Because at the end of the day, and people are only now starting to realize it, if you mess it up, if you force the animals, if you push your luck, you go too close, you do things, you don't get the best images, you don't get the best visuals. And that we've been pushing slowly. That You know what? I would rather you stay back, use a 600 mil, then get you next to the thing and use a 24 um, the, the educational side of what we're doing, what a lot of people are doing online of showing that and talking about it's great. But, but Judy, I think over time now, people have seen that if you give these things, the, the space and lodges and reserves are buying into this, then you get better experiences, better visuals, and ultimately better images. You don't want to see, you don't want to see a stressed animal. And, and even if I show someone here, a picture of a serval, which is one of the smaller cats in Africa. Even if you don't know the, the animal's behavior, you're still going to see if it's a stressed animal and you don't want that. So, so slowly, it, it, there are 100% still people who do the wrong thing. I've seen horrible things out in the field that people do, 
but it does seem to be more of a topic because actually thinking about it now, before social media, it was worse because then people could do whatever. So now the, the kind of name and shame thing has, has in this instance done a bit of a good thing, but it, it's a process. It is a process. Interesting. Now, now, Jerry, being that a lot of our viewers out there are watching presentations like this because they're planning on taking a safari. Yes. You, very experienced. Is there something that you see people either fail to research or mm -hmm. something that mm -hmm. is misconceived or misconstrued? What is, mm -hmm. what is something that you see a lot of where you wish people would know when they were researching mm -hmm. these types of trips? Yeah, hundred percent. It's a very good question. Derek. It's the biggest thing is if you're a photographer, there's, there's two elements to the process of planning a, a trip for yourself. Number one is decide on the images that you want. And number two, the experience that you want. Because for example, if you are wanting to photograph lions on foot, you're not gonna to go to the Masai Mara because you can't do it there. So that's an experience point of view. If you want images of uh, lions and trees, you need to go to a certain place. So to try and balance out, what are the images that I want? And what is the experience that I want? So, so if, if, if anybody, I mean, I'm more than happy to bounce ideas with anybody if they wanna get hold of me. You don't, you don't have to travel with me. I'm just happy to, to help you guys out. It would be, Look at how long you want to travel, what time of year you want to travel. Cool. If you want to see that great migration, but you can only travel in March uh, or, or April, it might be a bit of a challenge. So we have to, to, to look at that. But what is the thing you want to see and what is the thing you want to experience and try and merge those two. The, one, the first thing I normally do when someone wants to plan a trip or a private guided trip, I, I've, I've had a couple of meetings in New York here about this specific thing. There's questions. What is your budget? When do you want to go? What kind of images do you want? Do you want to photograph video? Do you want to do spotlight photography? Do you want to be on foot? So it's not a, it's not a singular do this, do that. It's a, it's a bit of a process, but if you do it correctly, the upside is just, it's, it over indexes. It's golden when you do it right. That's awesome. Now, Jerry, how many of these tips that you gave today are going to work at the Bronx Zoo up the block? <laughs> Every single one of them. No, so, so funny enough, I mean, I was speaking to a client of mine yesterday here. We had lunch somewhere close up here somewhere. And we were talking about when we come back. I'm looking to come back in October um, and to do something at the Bronx Zoo because a lot of people don't have the privilege of going to these places all the time, whatever it is. But you could definitely, the difference would be, let's say, and I don't know what they have there, but let's say you have a lion. That thing is not going to be as naturally aggressive or territorial, but it's going to react more to people. So if you just if you just swing the swing the, the 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 what would the word be the attention in that way, I think you can still pull some of the tricks off, eh? <laughs> there you go. Well, look, if you do make it happen in October, I'm right up the block from there, so we got oh, to. There we go. 100%. <laughs> Final question here, coming from Elizabeth Jerry. How important were the guides during the safari and in getting the photos? Um, how important was the guide? Like, how important was the guide for the guest to get the photos? Is that the question? Like if, if Ooh, Derek? Have, yeah, how, how important mm -hmm. is the guide to getting the, is, is the guide, is it like 80% hedged upon like you having a really uh, good right. guide to get really good photos or is it? Mm. So, I mean, the idea with us, I mean, and I'm going to be brutally honest with you here. When we, when I get people uh, guide specifically inquiring to come and work for us and they send me something and they say, here are my top 12 images. I close the book immediately. I'm not interested. I'm interested in whether you can guide the guest. Can you put them in the best position? Can you make them understand what they're looking at photographing and help them leave with the shots? So I would like to say, in a, if it's done correctly, if a photographic safari or a, or a nature travel uh, experience is done correctly, that the guide should be able to add value. Look here, don't do that, pull back. He's going to do this. Let's go here rather. Yes, yes, but the line, no, no, we don't want that shot. We want this shot. I do think that it makes a huge difference if you have the right guide. It does make a massive difference. Um, the, the One of my, Andrew, my business partner, he almost calls it like, a, like being a photographic caddy So for golf. So I know the course, I know which clubs you have to use, but you have to pull it off. So I can say to you, maybe try this lens, try this. It's your image. I'm just, I'm just the, a resource. I'm like your chat GPT for photography <laughs> in a kind of, Putting it into that side, and then, but it's like a caddy. It's I'll help you with the lenses, what to do, some creative ideas, but you got to execute. So, Elizabeth, it is a big thing. You can get it on your own, but I think you you up your chances when you when you um, 
have the guide with you to kind of just be that support. Awesome. That makes perfect sense. I mean, you, mm-hmm. you would think it would be, you want somebody who knows a lot of knowing mm-hmm. behaviors is hinged upon people who are doing this. I mean, just like I said earlier, just listen yeah. to talk. I can tell Jerry knows this stuff back to front, left to right, all around. So it's that confidence mm-hmm. that you would instill in mm-hmm. if I'm going around. I know that your knowledge is going to help me. I know what I have to do on the photo end. Your knowledge mm-hmm. is going to put me in the right place. I, th- I think the the nice thing is that also and and it, I mean for for me what we do is when we when we want to send people home from a trip is it's not with images first the number the first thing you need to have when you go and photograph wildlife is you need to have a good time um, you need to smile throw on a campfire have a whiskey whatever the case might be um, on the second thing is I want you to learn something and not just about photography or inspiration but also about the world you're photographing I mean we we have a certain privilege and duty i think to when you go to places like svalbard to photograph polar bears or or i don't know um, the masamara to photograph lions to tell those stories in the best way possible so that there's a learning element to that and then only then so after having a good time after learning something then it's images i would just the last thing i could recommend to people if you ever do go and photograph wildlife never ever hinge the success of your trip on the images that you get then you're going to lose then you're going to lose. It's an experience, first of all, and then the creating part comes at the back of it. I love that. That's that's the perfect note to end on here. And I want to remind everybody, we did have Jerry's information up there, Instagram uh, website. Go check that out. And if you guys did want a copy of this presentation, Jerry's been very generous in offering that up. So if anybody wants to, to send Jerry an email, he'll get that sent over. Jerry, it's always great having you on, man. It's good to, good to see you again. It's been a couple of years now. I think it was like 2019. Last time. Too long, man. Too long. Yeah. Too long. So huge thank you. A ton of experience. Any any projects, any last words you have uh, for us? Oh, no. I mean, I mean, if I can help anybody to plan a trip or just to help them with the images, that's absolutely great. Otherwise, yeah, I mean, Derek, you and I'll chat. Hopefully we can do something in October. But yeah, just thanks for the opportunity. It's always great to share with you guys. Always awesome. Great to always have you on, Jerry. To all of our viewers, thank yeah. you for not only tuning in, but engaging with us. That's all we got for you today. Huge thank you to everybody out there, especially the people watching live on YouTube. I know we don't normally stream there, so it's always nice to get the YouTube crowd in as well. But a huge thank you to our viewers, our guests of the hour. 